Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel, The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm here with Dr. Iris Berendt. She's professor of psychology at Northeastern University in the U.S. Her research examines the nature of linguistic competence, its origins, and its interaction with reading ability. She is the author of the book The Phonological Mind. She will also be releasing a new book in the near future called The Blind Storyteller. So, Dr. Barron, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Sure, thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so I would like to start by asking you, because I guess that perhaps most people out there who are not familiar with the field don't really know what linguistics is about. I guess that most lay people, when, when they get exposed to this term, they think that people are just studying perhaps uh, how grammar from different languages work and how to talk and write correctly and things like that. But that's not really the case when it comes to linguistics nowadays as a scientific discipline, right? Right. So when you're a linguist or a psycholinguist and you go to a cocktail party, so people, you see that people totally don't understand what you're doing and there are all kinds of misconceptions about what this is all about. So, you know, one thing that people immediately ask you is, oh, you speak lots of languages or, oh, you know how to speak correctly, right? So there is this misconception of the study of languages being a catalog of all languages and all words and all sentences or uh, the language police, meaning, you know, this is how you speak correctly and this is how you don't speak. And this is totally not what it's about. So, of course, knowing how languages work and you know, ob obtaining data from different languages is, is, is helpful, but that's not the goal and that, that's not the question. Rather, this is means for an end and the end is to understand language as a human capacity. So the question is really what capacity of the human mind and the human brain allow you and me to communicate in a way that animals do not. So, uh, you know, an example that I often give is, you know, my daughter, Alma, and we used to have a cat that was called Leah. She's no longer with us, but they all both came to us at about the same time um, when Alma was really little. And they stayed for about, you know, 17 years together and with quite significant differences in this experiment because Alma learned how to speak a language, Leah never did. And the, the enterprise in the study of language is to understand the reason for the difference. So why Alma acquired language and why Leah did not, what explains the differences in their capacities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's very interesting. And I guess there's a very rich history of how linguistics developed uh, and I mean, at least at a certain point, and this is also part of psychology, uh, B.F. Skinner really had an approach that, of course, was called behaviorism, but basically he, he tried to arrive at how people acquired language, but by reducing it just to reinforcement schedules, let's say, that is, the child would be exposed to words and perhaps uh, she would look at how people use them and perhaps then uh, uh, with time she would start producing language by herself and then perhaps when it worked uh, she, she was positively reinforced by what she produced linguistically uh, and when it didn't work she was punished in some way but then came Noam Chomsky uh, and he really brought a revolution to cognitive science in general but also more specifically to linguistics so could you tell us a little bit about what he did there and what is uh, and what are the main differences between his approach and Skinner's approach yeah 
So the Skinner-Chomsky debate is actually ongoing. It was never resolved in cognitive science. So the question that we were raised by these two figures remain very much active. There is sometimes in slightly different formulation, but you know, the, the real question is really, you know, where language comes from. And the Skinner notion is language is coming from experience. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's the um, linguistic environment that is available to the child that is allowed, that is the primary source of their capacity for language. Um, so, to put it differently, how does a child acquire language? Why do I say I love you? Why I don't say love I you? The answer is I'm imitating my parents. So, Alma, my daughter, heard me saying many times I love you, and that's why she she does so. And the capacity to chain words together is really not something that is very unusual or specific to language. You chain I and love, presumably by the same mechanism that allows you to, you know, look at traffic lights, right? So you know that you first have the red light and then you have the green light and one follows the other. There is just a general sequencing capacity. The words I and love follow each other by the same principles. And this debate then is whether the capacity to sequence linguistic elements is a broad cognitive capacity that is not specific to language or whether there's something unique to language that we are endowed with. And it's this capacity that is necessary to explain um, how we, we get language. Um, there are several reasons to think that, you know, so just to put things straight, there's no question that learning is important. Nobody doubts that. We're not all speaking Chinese or we're not all speaking English. Languages differ and learning absolutely has something to do with that. But so it's a really more nuanced question. The question is, is learning from experience sufficient to explain what's going on in, in language acquisition? And there are different reasons to expect that this might not be the case. Um, one situation in which this becomes very clear is when you look at um, what happens when children are not exposed to a language. And um, I'm, this is, uh, in modern way at times, this is evident when you have deaf children who are reared by, you know, loving, supporting families who are not deprived them of anything, but because the parents are not speaking a sign language, they are simply unable to provide them with sign language that the child can process. And under these circumstances, what you see is that the children do not remain language-less. They do not just um, uh, re remain without recourse to com linguistic communication, but rather they form sign languages of their own. And when I say sign language, I don't mean pantomime, or, you know, just using your hands in the way that, you know, I would be doing this. This is not a sign language. Rather, sign languages have specific structure that is shared to some extent with spoken language, to other extent it's different, but there are certain principles that govern sign languages that are not present in, in pantomime. And when these deaf children begin to communicate using their hands, what they're doing is following linguistic principles that are gradually enriching. This has been seen in individual, um, in, in the context of individ uh, individual children and individual families. So these are called home science systems. They have been uh, studied uh, extensively by Susan Golden Meadow at the University of Chicago. Um, there are also entire sign languages that emerge anew. So Nicaraguan sign language is one such example uh, that has been studied by Jody Kegel and Ansengas. And what they've shown is these are cases in which, um, in, in the case of Nicaraguan sign languages, children were brought together in the attempt to teach them how to lip read. So there were deaf children, they had no sign language at home. They came to the school and all they were taught is how to lip read Spanish, which they actually did not do very well at all. But what happened is the children were brought together and when you bring children together, they start communicating with each other and they start communicating with, communicating with each other using their hands, using manual sign language. And it turns out again that when linguists looked carefully at what the children were doing, what they uh, saw is that a language is born, that the language is born anew which is demonstrably different from, you know, uh, gesturing and pantomime. And, and, um, and that suggests that there is something inherent to the child that brings this capacity. 
Um, you also see the same principles that are not coming just from experience, even in children, although they, in, in normal children, in normal language acquisition, although there it's a little harder to, to see, but they can give you a sense of um, how this is done. So a famous case in this, uh, in this area has to do with how you form questions. So how, if I say you, tell you she is smiling, how do you form the English question, is she smiling or is the girl who is happy is smiling, right? How do you know exactly, so you're moving something, right? You're moving the is component, but how do you know if you have two of them, as in the girl who is, smile, the girl who is happy is smiling, how do you know which is to move and how do you form that? And so you might think that the child might be just imitating the somehow, uh, you know, observing the sentences that are around them and from that um, in imitating what's or, or partly based on imitation, partly based on inference, but from there trying to figure out uh, what's the right rule. And it turns out that this actually is unlikely to be the right answer. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical uh, analysis, but rather give you the sense of what's going on there. And what's going on there is you can imagine yourself, I don't know if you like to hike, but if you go, say, around and, and hike in, in a new terrain that you don't know, and you sometimes get to this crossroads where you can either go on one path and you can go on another path, and you don't know which you know, where the path will lead you, and you need to make the decision right there and there, right there at that moment to, to figure out where you should be going. It turns out that ultimately one path will lead you to the right place, will lead you to, let's say, heaven, and the other one will lead you to the wrong place, which is hell. And in terms of language acquisition, one decision that you can make will bring you to the right rule and another will bring you to the wrong rule. But given where you are, given that the information that's available at this very moment of language acquisition, you can logically go either way. But the problem is that only one of them is correct. So there is actually not information out there to tell the child where to go. And the question is, what do they do? How do they don't go astray? Well, one possibility is that they might go astray. Maybe the children do make these mistakes. But um, work by, for example, Stephen Crane has shown that that's actually not the case. The children do not never go to hell. They only go to heaven, right? They only select the right path. And, and that is a problem because there is no evidence. So what linguists are doing is the strategy in this case is to ask what information is available to, child, to the child, you know, which path to follow. So actually, I should take a step back. First to show that there are two paths. First to show that you can either go one way or, or another. You can also ask what information is available to the child to decide. This is very, very controversial, but I think there is good evidence to suggest, at least in some of the cases, that there is really no way for the child to choose. And then to ask what the child actually is doing. And at least for some of these cases, I think the evidence is clear that the child is not going astray, even though they, there is a choice available to them. And therefore, um, the information that's available to the child is, is insufficient to explain what they ultimately choose. So another way to put it is to say that the, the information that's available to the child is poor. That is Chomsky's argument from the poverty of the stimulus, as it's known, you saying, there's no way that the child can just imitate what's going on, what's available to them, because if they did that, they would get to hell, to the linguistic hell, so to speak, and they don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's also the case that, uh, I mean, parents and people around the child uh, also don't uh, formally instruct them uh, in terms of the language, that is, the, the, they don't... Uh, they they are not thought by their parents uh, in formal ways uh, in yeah. how to speak the language, right? Yeah, no, this is absolutely true, and that's you know I, I'm sorry if I might have kind of uh, jumped a, a step uh, ahead. Yeah, no child ever gets you know grammar lessons about how you form questions. So at no point is the child told you know, move the auxiliary of the main clause, you know, this is not how language acquisition is going. The problem, though, is much worse than that. So, obviously, it's the child that needs to make some inferences about what the right rules. Everybody, everybody agrees on that. 
even if you grant the child this capacity to make this inference, so the, the, the notion is the child has this really complex tacit capacity. It's not an explicit rule. The child can never tell you what are the rules of syntax. But there is something in the child brain that allows them to infer rules of language of which they are totally unaware. Nobody has ever taught them the rules. Nonetheless, the question that was raised by Chomsky and by, I mean, wasn't by Skinner because Skinner thought it makes no sense to talk about rules in the first place. But by, you know, in modern time that is raised by modern empiricists and modern rationalists like Chomsky is, okay, we know that the child is doing that all tacitly. All this miracle, everybody agrees that this is going on. The question is, given that the child has this inferential capacity, what information drives it? And one possibility is, there is this big linguistic data out there that the child simply needs to mine using mechanisms that are not specific to language. And if you do that, you'll get the right rules. What Chomsky is saying is this actually is not enough because what's out there could have led you to the wrong path. So if you just go by logic, if you just fit um, think about it like mathematical functions into the linguistic information that's available to you. You could have gone many, many ways that no child ever goes by, and that requires an explanation. So um, in that sense, the information that's available to the child is not sufficient to guide language acquisition, even when you think about it in those tacit terms that the child actually has this amazing capacity to infer rules that they're totally unaware of what those rules are. I hope it makes mm -hmm. sense. Y yes, yes, it makes sense. Uh, and I would just like to ask you just to clarify this a little bit more for people who are not really familiar with this subject. So, uh, uh, since Chomsky, uh, do we, uh, are we also considering in, linguistic, in linguistics the innate components Oh, yeah. uh, of our cognition that are specifically dedicated to language acquisition. Is that right. the case? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Chomsky in modern time is the, uh, you know, responsible for implanting this notion of universal grammar in, in you know, in, in the intellectual community. And his suggestion by that is to make things, so what is universal grammar? It's this set of rules of language, very broad rules. They have to be very broad because we are born with them, they are common to every human language. This is the mold by which every human language is kind of shaped. So it has to be something that is very broad because it's common to English and to Japanese and to Swahili and any human language, if it's right. But the notion is there is such a mold by which all languages are shaped. and. It's this general principle with which we are born that presumably help us solve the problem of the poverty of the stimulus. So if you think about the metaphor of you, you know, standing there with the two paths of where am I going to go in language acquisition? Am I going to choose this rule or that rule? Which of course is totally unconscious. Universal grammar is what tells you go in this way and do not even consider the other because you know, this is this is kind of your um, you know guide in, in language acquisition, so to speak. So, yeah, that's his proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is it the case that, uh, and I don't know if this makes sense perhaps from an evolutionary perspective, but is it the case that people uh, tend to associate uh, certain sounds to certain uh, things uh, in the world? Ah, yeah, uh, they do, they do. So uh, you you mean to link certain sounds with certain concepts? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yes, and, and perhaps, I, I don't know, perhaps just to give an example, uh, uh, associate one sound that has specific uh, traits with something out there that perhaps uh, in a certain way resembles that yeah. sound. Yeah, so obviously we do. So we talk about cats that meow, right? So that has something to do with how the sound that the cat is making. 
Um, there are actually more, that, and you know, that, that there are other examples to that. So, um, an interesting case um, was, uh, is a group of scientists led, led by Blasi who uh, surveys about 6,000 uh, word lists, let's call them languages, and ask, are there certain associations that are occurring between certain concepts and certain sounds? And they did find such associations, and this is across thousands and thousands of languages. So that's kind of an interesting finding. So to give an example, what they find is the concept of breast is associated with sounds like um, e, m and u, which are all both round. Um, what does it mean? So I don't think that the, the words themselves are, are innate. That is unlikely because languages are so different from each other in this way. But what might be innate is there might be some common pressures about concepts. So, you know, what we, this is in the, in the, you know, how the human body looks like and the fact that the breasts are around or that the children um, 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 uh, use the lips um, in, in nursing. And, it, and we associate the two things to, and oh, sorry, so we talked about the concept and there is, of course, the sound itself as well. So the ba and u sounds are produced by the lip that has this rounding of shape and you associate things that are similar together. So that's not so surprising that when two things are similar, they tend to be brought together. What to make of that? So the reasons why, so you know, why is it interesting and why people raise those things? And you raise those things precisely because it's an exception to the rule, because it's not the rule, right? Um, because this is not usually how words are formed. Um, if I give you in, a word in a new language, if I tell you what is Kelev, what do you think Kelev means? You probably don't know if you don't know Hebrew. So typically, you, there are no discernible associations between sounds and meaning. Um, why? Because typically the link between sound and meaning is arbitrary and it's the power of language to do that. So it's the power of language for me to use this totally crazy sound combination, Kelev, and in so doing implant a concept in your brain, right? And that's really an interesting, unique capacity of language. Now there are, excep there are exceptions to the rules. There are situations in which the concepts and the sounds share something in common and, and the examples I've noticed is, is one of them. But I think that's actually what's, mo what's more interesting is this powerful capacity to link sounds and meaning even when they have nothing in common, which that I think is really the more um, interesting capacity of, of language um, that, that um, I think is really, to me actually is much more surprising. Mm -hmm. Yes, so from all of what you just said, I, I get that uh, language is a specialized cognitive system that we have, but uh, it also has some associations with uh, other cognitive non-linguistic systems. So, for example, it also connects to things like our perception works, how our motor systems work, and also the fact that perhaps we need to categorize things in order to think about them and to deal with them intellectually. And perhaps uh, all of these things also influence how languages get built up, right? Yeah, so language is only done in a certain cognitive niche with a certain bodily niche of how the human body works. Um, what my work specifically is about phonology, which is probably where you see this tension between language and the body, you know, more uh, clearly than any other domain. So, um, you know, phonology is, has to do with um, how we, in the simplest terms, express words using elements that are themselves meaningless. So the fact that, um, you know, to express the word God, uh, you're expressing that by sequencing three different sounds. 
And you become aware of that by the fact that if you were to change the order of the sounds, you'll get a totally different word. So if you know, instead of God, you'll get dog, for instance, right? Just by uh, changing the sequence. And phonology is telling you how to sequence those sounds, why certain sequences are okay and why others are not. Dog and God are both equally good sequences in English, but you can think about others that are not. So gda would not be a good sequence in English. It would be perfectly fine in Hebrew, for instance. So the question is, what are the constraints on those sequencing? And this is where the link with the body, with the sensory and motor system becomes very evident. And in fact, if I asked my, you know, most lay people, why do people think that gda is bad? They would immediately say, of course, you know, it's really hard to articulate. So it's not a linguistic rule, it's not an abstract notion that prevents you from putting those sounds together, but it's directly the articulatory motor system that is kind of driving the car there. So it is the, so it's not a lingui, it's not a, an abstract rule that prevents us from putting those two sounds together, da, uh, actually three, right? But rather it is the fact that we just can't articulate that. Of course, I just show you that you can, right? So, uh, but it, the, the argument can be more nuanced. So maybe it's harder for us to articulate it, and and that's why we don't say it together. Um, and what I've been doing in my work is try to adjudicate between these possibilities. And here, I think it's kind of important to keep in mind that the fact that you might have these kind of two pressures. There is the pressure of language, and there is the pressure of the body. That does not necessarily mean that um, it's one or the other. So it may well be the case that the design of language during evolution has evolved to abide by those bodily pressures. So it could very well be the case that the restrictions on GDA, why this is not a great combination, have some distant motivation in articulation but the direct cause of those restrictions remains the language system. So you can think about it as kind of a two-step process in which evolution has designed the grammar in a certain way, designed universal grammar rather in a certain way. It, um, uh, it favored languages that are going to abide by the restrictions of the body, but the direct reason why you're going to tell me that da is a bad sequence may not come necessarily from your articulation system, but rather from those abstract rules. Now, this is an empirical question. You can go to the lab, do experiments, and find out which one is the right answer. Um, how? Well, one way is you can uh, disrupt the motor system. So there is this um, uh, technique that is called transcranial magnetic stimulation that allows you to deliver current to specific areas uh, in the brain. And with my collaborator, Dr. Alvaro Pascual Leone over at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess here in Boston, what we've done is um, uh, basically zapped our participants' brain in particular sites, so in the site in this case that controls the uh, lips, so it's called the lip motor area. So I should say, you know, in the motor strip in the brain, there are specific sites that, speci that control specific um, organs of the body. There is a site that controls the lip. There is another one that controls the tongue and so forth. And what we did was to disrupt the site that controls the tongue. And the question is, what is it going to do to phonology? And the notion is that if phonology is all about articulation, right? If the reason why you prefer certain sounds to others is you're trying to actually say it and fail, then if we were to zap this area, then your knowledge of phonology is going to be attenuated. And that's not at all what we found. So that is one reason why we think that the knowledge of language does not de depend directly on articulation, that the link is much more indirect. Um, in another set of studies, we looked at what, uh, in collaboration with uh, Jacques Miller's lab, um, the first author in the study was David Gomez, um, uh, both papers were, were published in PNS, which is a good place to publish. Um, so in that study, uh, we asked what happens when you take neonates who obviously cannot say anything um, and look at what their, which structures, which phonological forms are easier for the brain to process. And again, we found that um, infants uh, prefer certain, so 
uh, uh, syllables like blah. Um, the infant brain uh, processes that more, the more easily compared to structures such as uba. So again, that tells us, even though there is a good articulatory reason for why those constraints are the way they are, it looks to us like the immediate cause of your linguistic preferences comes from abstract linguistic constraints in the language system rather than the distant articulatory cause. So yeah, there is kind of this really interesting mind-body tension where the design of, of our cognitive system is not arbitrary, but that doesn't mean that it does not exist, meaning that the direct cause of what we're doing language comes from the body directly. Now, I, I just want to make it clear, I'm not a Cartesian dualist. I'm not saying that the language system is not in the brain. Obviously, it does. But it's um, but the point is that those principles are abstract principles rather than the principles of the motor system. I hope I, I, I made it clear. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure, sure. And that's all very interesting. And so now I would like to ask you if there's any evidence of uh, language occurring also in non-human animals and i mean perhaps there we could tackle this question by this question by two different sides the first one we could talk perhaps about the species that are the biologically closest to us that is our primate cousins of course because i mean through, throughout the last few decades, at least, we have, uh, we have had some interesting cases, at least, of some primates acquiring, uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure if they really acquired it, but at least they were able to use sign language to a certain extent. And then, on the other end, uh, species, the other species that are a bit uh, f uh, more far from us, like, for example, uh, cetaceans and dolphins uh, and even bird species, who seem to be able to learn particular local dialects. But I'm not sure if we should classify that as language or not. Yeah, I think you put the question in a really uh, very intelligent way um, because, yes, there is. So the question is what other species are vocal learners? Um, and it is indeed the case that our closest relatives are not really great at vocal learning. And it's really more this more distant species that are the, you know, um, exceptional vocal learners. Um, these two uh, research methodologies are also different. So um, in the case of our, um, so, and, and actually for a good reason. So it's precisely because our primate relatives are not great vocal learners that to try to examine their capacities, they were tested on their abilities to learn a human language um, as opposed to uh, their own system of communication, right? And um, so I think it was the 70s that a group of researchers at Columbia University uh, led by Herb Terras, um, they got this chimp that was called Nimchimsky for obvious reason. Uh, and, and, you know, and they tried to look at whether the chimp will acquire a language. And of course, the broader question is whether the capacity for language is shared with um, other non-human animals. And they taught him sign language just because there are obviously uh, one, limit, one uh, barrier for language acquisition is sensory and motor capacities so to try to um, um, avoid the articulatory uh, or to override or to kind of um, go around the, the articulatory restriction, um, he was taught a sign language. Yes, he acquired some sign language. Yes, he acquired some signs. Yes, he formed some combination. Yes, he formed some novel combination. But when you look at exactly what he was doing, you see that he used language in a way that really children do not use. So while there are some superficial similarity to, similarities to human language, there are significant differences to what children are doing. So for example, he would use signs and repeat the same sign over and over. You know, it would be akin to me saying, you know, big boy, 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 or something, or, you know, give me, give me, give me, and in that way generate these super long sentences, which human children do not do. So, um, 
it's one of those cases where the presumed achievements kind of question the capacity more than they affirm it. Um, in the case of birds and uh, you know and, and dolphins and whales, this is actually very interesting. So and there in, in, in those situations, what one typically looks at is the natural system of communication in that um, in, in that species and ask tries to uh, define this species. And there one finds really rich systems of communication um, which uh, have some you know, similarities to human language. So, for example, let's say similarities, not identities. So, um, one really interesting uh, case um, by my colleague Evan Balaban, who looked at swamp sparrows. So, it turns out that swamp sparrows in New York and swamp sparrows in Minnesota both share the same vocabulary, so to speak. They have the same notes, so the same specific elements. Um, but they combine them in different ways. So um, if we call them one and six for the two different nodes, um, one species is doing one six and the other is doing syllables like six one. So it's a little bit similar to blah versus ba in, in the example I gave you. And, and, and they communicate like this naturally. That's the natural system of communication. And when one looks at this rule more carefully, one sees that it's a really very broad rule. For example, um, you can take one, stick any other note in the middle, and then stick the other note, six, at the end, and the bird would still consider it its language. So it's, it's a very powerful system, and that, that's quite impressive. Um, whether it's language or not is really an empirical question. So this really opens a research program in which one can start by identifying what we mean by language, what are design principles of human language, then goes to go to other species and ask, here is my laundry list of what I think is critical about language, A, B, C, D. Do I find A? Do I find B? Do I find C? And that can be a, a real active and, and rich research program. From what we tell right now, there are similarities but there are some significant differences, uh, which suggest that when we say language, it really means it's really a, a natural class in the in the sense that it really means something very specific. So, um, for example, one thing that is uh, perhaps easier to explain is this metaphor of language is a double layer cake, right? So. Language is all about patterns, right? I say, I love you, or I say, blow. But blog and I love you are patterns at a different level. In blog, I'm taking sounds that are meaningless, elements that are meaningless. B has no meaning, L has no meaning, and I put them together to create one level, the word blog. When I say, I love you, I take three elements that each has a meaning and put them together. So by this double layer cake, there is this patterns of meaningless elements and there is pattern of meaningful elements. What we don't you do, what we do not do as humans is create sen sentences from individual sounds. So you could have imagined a language in which, you know, there is a word for, you know, I means, you know, I and, and you means oh and love means ooh and you would say ah oh ooh ooh ah oh and, and so forth and that would and that's how the language works. So there would is going to be only one uh, level of patterning and that's not what we find in humans. That here however is what we find in animals and we don't know of any animal species that naturally communicate with this lab, double care double layer communication cake. This is not something that we know of. And that suggests a significant design um, uh, difference between human languages and non-human languages. 